Welcome to another episode of the Enlightenment Operatives Podcast. I'm your host, Charles F. Moreland III, and today I got a very, very special guest. She's the internationally published author of Plant-Based Himalaya, 38 Vegan Recipes from Nepal. She's also a photographer, owner of Vegan Nepal website, YouTube channel, and amazing Instagram account, as well as first-time documentary filmmaker, and most importantly, my wife, Babita Shrestha. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing really good. Namaste, everyone. And thank you so much for inviting. I'm really excited today. I think I'm a little bit more excited. <laughs> so let's jump right into it. Okay. We're trying to hype the book, obviously, because it's an amazing book. Just came out a couple months ago. Tell us a little bit about what inspired you to make plant-based Himalaya. First of all, there is no vegan or vegetarian cookbook from Nepal. And I had just graduated with graphic design degree. But I didn't want to do graphic design. I was really into food. So somehow I discovered the world of cookbooks at the age of 30. And I decided, uh, I think I was meant to write books. And that's how I started to dream about it in 2016. And then eventually in 2019, I decided I think this is the right time. I should focus in my cookbook and not worry about anything else. And that's how I completed it in 2020 and then found a publisher in 2021. And then the book came out in 2022. Nice. It's a gorgeous, beautiful, hardbound, almost 400 pages, right? Yes. Beautifully photographs. And I want to I wanna give you a big, big, huge shout out because I come from the world of music, uh, from the video thing, and I see left and right, everything is corporate plants. And what I mean by that is a lot of publishers, record labels, TV shows, they're much more concerned about finding big, air quote, influencers uh -huh, instead yeah. of actual <laughs> influential pe people to work with. And they find these people that are just, they're fake. They don't do any of their own work. And someone else writes their book. Someone else photographs their book. Someone probably writes the recipes. Yeah. Someone does the graphic design, all that. And I'm sure this is a unicorn situation where you were not only the author of it, you took all the photographs, besides the ones I took. <laughs> you cooked everything. Yeah. You stylized everything. Yeah. You even did the graphic design and yeah. editing and illustration work. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty rare, right? Uh, I think that is very rare because a lot of chefs, they are more into only cooking or doing a restaurant business. But my case is very different because even though I always wanted to become a chef, it never happened. And somehow the world of art, let's say, invited me and then that's how I ended up with graphic design degree with my fine arts. But uh, I think that also helped me a lot to see the whole picture of how a photograph works, how design works, and how food photography, styling, and design is a very important part of a cookbook. You can just be a photographer and shoot food photography. You have to be really into food or you really have to have an eye for the food. So that's how what I discovered when I discovered the world of cookbooks that my niche was really food and uh, food photography, food design, and my food, or let's say my cooking, my uh, styling and photography and design all combined 
I thought that cookbook is the uh, is the ultimate art that I can create. I'm glad you bring that up because that's the whole purpose of this podcast is I want to talk to artists about their art, about what inspires them to do their art and their creative process. And I think a lot of people don't see uh, culin- culinary field as artistic. Yeah, absolutely not if you come from a middle class family. <laughs> I think in general. Uh, yeah. And even, um, I mean, there's a lot of TV shows, but it's all cooking competition crap. Like, I'm not really into that stuff. Uh, <laughs> I don't see that as artistic. Yeah. But what you really do with it does, it, it, I feel a lot of love. I, I see a lot of passion in it. And so you consider yourself an artist. I know the photography, obviously, but... Absolutely. Um, I have always seen food as art since I was very young. But of course, I had no idea about food photography or food design. And then uh, this world of graphic design and then world of cookbook really opened my eyes in a way that when I went through this bookstore, I see there is a lot of cookbooks, but there is a lot of thing missing in between the recipe, let's say the recipe and the photography that goes in the book, and then the design part. And that's how I realized that uh, most of these books, they might have great recipes, but they don't have great photography. This photographer doesn't have a deep interest in food or either again the designer, this person can be a great designer, but this person is not really interested in designing food. So that's how it helped me to understand myself because I was also trying to understand myself and what I really wanted to do in my life. And that's how I realized that, uh, wow, like, (laughs) that's how I realized that uh, I already know how to write cookbooks and I don't even know this world. So I decided that uh, I would like to pursue this passion of mine and then just keep working and see like where it takes me. And that's how uh, within a year I started my Vegan Nepal pop-up. It's still again my passion. I wasn't really thinking that I will be coming so far, but I wanted to become a chef. And I saw this world of uh, world of food that uh, there was again another link miss- missing. That um, people are opening restaurants, but I don't really see there are a lot of vegetarian or vegan options, especially not really uh, healthy ones. And uh, that's how I started seeing so many missing parts in our own society where I was living at that time and over the seven years of my, let's say, work or struggle or, you know, my passion, I have discovered too many things that I would have never discovered if I would not have thought of pursuing food art as the goal of my life right now. I'm glad you mentioned the, about other restaurants and options and the vegan plant-based, let's say, community. Yeah, not the healthy ones. <laughs> yeah, most of it. I know when I quit eating meat, Yeah. you think, oh, I'm going to eat this fake meat that's just corporate crap. Yeah. Which is worse for you than eating meat, probably. Yeah. And that's definitely where I was for a while. And that's the problem I have when I go to a lot of these plant-based reci- uh, restaurants and a lot of these plant-based uh, cookbooks that I see. It's all tofu and seitan. Or Definitely. you have to use the Beyond Beef and all this, like, corporate Bill Gates, just horrible, just unhealthy crap. Yeah. In your book, I mean, do you even use tofu in any of it? Uh, For my first cookbook, I decided not to use any tofu because there are 38 recipes and while I was growing up, there were no packaged food. Yeah, and plant-based recipes that for the, it's a crazy concept, actually use plants and vegetables (laughs) for the recipes. You don't see that very often and that's pretty crazy to me. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, like I said, like uh, making a cookbook, putting a cookbook out, and really having a desire and passion to do what you want to do as a food, as an art, especially plant-based food and art, is different than just putting a cookbook out there. It's two different thing. Uh, you can be a really great, uh, let's say social media person and can have let's say 200,000 followers or you know 10k followers and you can easily get a deal with the publishers but uh, most of them are I would consider content creator and being a content creator and pursuing food as an art is again two different things as an artist this is my passion and I want to not only create something, but I'll, I also want to grow myself with my art over the time. Nothing like, you know, I want to write a book of 100 recipes and that's it. Like, I don't know if I'm going to write another book or if I get a chance to publish another book next time or not. What is a good thing about my, uh, let's say, uh, work is uh, I'm the photographer, photo editor, and also a graphic designer, besides being a chef and a, a food artist. I can think about food in many different ways, and then I can also think that, you know, what kind of book I really want the person to have, so that person can not only help themselves, but also, like, if they really like the book, they can also pass it down to their friends or next generation. No, that's exactly what I was trying to bring up with the influencers versus someone who's actually influential. Um, when I look at my favorite artist or my favorite pieces of work of, that endure through time, it's not made by committees. Yeah. It's made by a single person with a singular vision. Not that they didn't have help doing it, but there's one person in charge, what's called them an auteur or whatever it's called. Yeah. And they took took control and they made it exactly the way they want to do it. And that, that type of art endures and you can tell the passion in it. So much of what's put out today is just garbage because it is creation by committee. I know in some of my past work experience. Yeah. They're creative fields, but you end up having to please this person and this person. Yeah. You got a board and yeah. then you got like, you know, the, the content person and the, in, the Instagram person, they all have their own input on something and you get some washed out piece of crap that no one likes because yeah. you're trying to please everybody and you're yeah. pleasing nobody. That's the problem with film today. Yeah. I think that's the problem with most music. Film, that's music. definitely most books yeah. the same way. Like, yeah, you're absolutely. trying to please everybody and it doesn't come out good. That's why I think your book turned out amazing because you did it exactly the way you wanted. Even people, yeah. you know, I'm sure your publisher had some input and you, I think you stood pretty strong on making it exactly the way How you I wanted. Want. Exactly. Um, so while I was in graphic design, I was in school. Uh, I was I was already doing some like internship work, where I discovered this thing that I'm designing something, but there are so many people who has input, and here I'm trying to create something, and now there is like ten different opinions to design this one poster, let's say for example, and by the end of the day, I feel like. I don't know what I'm doing, like what is this creation, like I'm not happy at all. Which is the uh, one reason I decided like after I graduated, I don't think I would like to do graphic design right now. I love design but this is not what I really wanted because I'm not creating, this is not my creation. So but um, within this one year break that I took in 2016 where I really sat down, did nothing, and then just was thinking what I really want to do. I mean, I would like to do some art, but then I can never really imagine myself not doing photography. And then, but my deep interest is in food because that is something I have been doing already over two decades at that time. So like, you know, graphic design and photography came later in my life. So that's how when I uh, discovered the cookbook world, I realized that wow, like 
there are so many worlds that exist that we don't even know and we will know over the time you just have to learn the skills and that was the right time for me when I thought about cookbook I feel like I can do the food I can do the photography exactly how I want because uh, I do have like a really great eye for food photography and then again food design is just like you know I just feel like wow like <laughs> this is so perfect like uh, and this was just a dream because I have never designed a book and um, growing up in Nepal uh, we don't really have culture of buying books and forget about uh, cookbooks like I have never seen cookbooks when I was in Nepal you know so uh, uh, when I was dreaming about just like dreaming about cookbooks I feel like oh my god I can write this book that book like you know it's just it opened my uh, just different world for me where I was just really happy just thinking about it like imagining about books so when was the first time that you actually looked inside a cookbook then? I think it was when I was 30 in 2016. Not till you were 30. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it feels so weird. When I hear you told me that, you know, so what do you think about cookbooks? I was like, uh, oh, cookbook? I know cookbook, but have I ever really looked a cookbook? Like, I, that was the realization for me, and I could not even think of ever looking at a cookbook or maybe in the library or I was I used to work in the bookstore even in my college I feel like I think I have never even seen a cookbook because I was too busy in my arts degree and just like you know looking at art book so at that time that's why we decided let's go to this Barnes and Noble and discover the world of cookbooks and luckily Barnes and Noble is so big that they had so many cookbooks from different parts of the world at one place and there were really amazing cookbooks and there were average cookbooks and there were some cookbooks that I used uh, that I thought that you know what is this design and photography oh my god like uh, I wonder like how these chefs are because there are so many chefs from around the world I didn't even know and uh, that was the time I just knew that uh, cookbook was for me and especially I already knew that uh, since I come from Nepal and I was so much into food and I never thought about cookbooks. I went to college for graphic design. I still didn't think about cookbooks. Do you understand what I mean? So like, do you feel like uh, in some way that your college could have done better? Absolutely. <laughs> the first thing I thought was like, I should have already written a mini book, you know, cookbook by now for my uh, college works. But for some reason, my college, I don't think they ever, they ever let us write any books. I mean, in my internship, I have done some booklet, which actually helped me to understand books. When I went to this bookstore, I was like, I, well, you asked me, have you ever written a book? And I was like, um, I don't think I have ever written a book, but I have written booklets, which is very similar idea. And I think I can write book. I mean, I was so happy at the time when I thought about like, I can write cookbooks. Oh my God, this is great. This is amazing. I think this is what, what is going to make me happy because it requires food photography, my food uh, cooking. And I always wanted to become a chef but never happened but now since I already uh, I was already like you know living a plant-based lifestyle I was like now I can become a plant-based chef so just idea of thinking about all that was just beautiful really amazing like thinking back when I had not even started my journey and since I started my journey, I'm just like so happy every year and every year and every year I want to do good and I have just like new ideas of I want to do this, I want to do that. So uh, I don't want to blame my college, obviously. <laughs> it could have done better, but I feel like if I didn't went to college, I would have never discovered graphic design because that was the time like, you know, I also discovered graphic design in college. I didn't know about that before I went to college. And uh, I also learned a lot of, you know, softwares that really helped me when I discovered this world. 
सो आई होप लाइक न्यू जेनरेसन कॉलेज और प्रोफेसर दे वुल रियली फोकस इन बुक्स एट लीस्ट लाइक फ्यू सेमेस्टर इन देयर कॉलेज बिकॉज बुक इज समथिंग दैट यू नो नॉट एवरीबॉडी वॉन्ट्स टू डू अ कॉर्पोरेट जॉब Not everybody, especially an artist. Less and less people want to do corporate exactly, jobs. Exactly, especially point. after this people lockdown. Yeah. So uh, for me, another reason was I don't want to, I don't want to like go to work nine and then come back at five and have this same routine and then I'm stuck there for rest of my life with just maybe three weeks, four weeks of holidays. That I just could not imagine because I need, I need a lot of free time to be creative. so maybe like you know i can take two months of off while i'm thinking and researching and you know doing my homework and then another two months i'm working in my computer my kitchen my photography so i feel like creative being creative requires a lot of time and then when you work in this corporate world you just don't have that freedom at all speaking of routine and time about a 400 page book how long did it take you to create this giant work of art <laughs> so i started i started my cookbook in 2019 second day of our wedding we went in this honeymoon and then i remember uh, i didn't want it to dry you were driving so i thought i will entertain you by just writing down all the recipes that's when january 5th that is when i started to write my book and then since then i have continuously given time by 2020 i would say i had finished rough draft and then few months later i decided to work back again and then by the end of 2020 i completed my book so it took me 2 years to complete my book but it wasn't uh, to be honest it i thought it was complete but uh i discovered that when i found my publisher in 2021 in april and when i and then when i started editing it with my copy editor that's when i had to go through all the book and then the photography and then the design and then illustration work uh, spelling errors you know things like that so finally let's say by the end of 2021 the book was finally complete so i know you have a bunch of photos of nepal in this book i think that's what makes it so spectacular besides the delicious recipes You get a lot of culture in there and a lot of beautiful mountain pics. Yeah. Uh a lot of these mountain pics are from your trip to Mardi Himal. Yes. We're talking about your journey. Yeah. So let's go ahead and talk about your documentary a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so the name of the film Yeah. Bottle Dara. Dara. Yeah. My journey mm-hmm. to Mardi, Mardi Himal. Himal. Yeah. I was lucky enough to do the soundtrack. Yeah, I was so and, happy. And uh, I also did some of the editing and yes. some of the cinematography cuz yes. I was also on the track with you. Yes. That was a hard track. It I'm was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Our first track, oh my god. <laughs> so tell me, have you always wanted to be a filmmaker as well? I mean, you're an author and now you're a filmmaker. That's a it's a dive it's a diverse portfolio, I'd say. So <clears throat> Let's say well, let's go back uh before I went to US. Now I got the visa, right? Before I got the visa, I wasn't sure what I really want to study. Then once I got my visa, I thought like, you know, I thought, I thought and thought I didn't know what to study because at that time I didn't know about a lot of majors. So I thought, you know what? I think I will become a really uh good filmmaker. I would like to be a director and cinematographer. But After a year of my school, of my college life, I found out that I don't think I can do this. Maybe because of the situation or maybe because you know it was in Nepal and to go to film school again you need the help of a lot of your friends and a lot of rich friends who is just free, you know. <laughs> so it didn't I didn't I couldn't see it happening. 
And that's how I decided, you know, I need to find another major where I can still uh, be creative. And uh, I'll think about filmmaking later because uh, things were rapidly changing at that time and you don't really have to go to film school to become a filmmaker unless, I guess, if you want to make a Hollywood movie or, you know, big screen movies. So I decided uh, I'm going to quit this filmmaking because I'm seeing, I don't see my future here. And then that's how I discovered graphic design because here I can still do photography, which was my interest. And I can still do some video work if I want. And then at the same time, I can uh, go into print design, which I feel like, you know, wow, I can write books as well or work in uh, publication or do some magazine work, I don't know, like. Well, tell us about this film specifically. I mean, why did you do this film and what, what, what is Badal Dara? <laughs> so Badal Dara is a place right before the Mardi Himal, uh, right, <laughs> right before the uh, Mardi Himal base camp. And the Badal means uh, clouds. Dara means hill, so it is like the hill of uh, clouds, and it is definitely hill of clouds, right with the uh, right below the mountains. It's really gorgeous. So, uh, why I wanted to do this uh, documentary? First of all, uh, now I have been doing photography and videography for let's say over a decade. And then I realized that uh, I love landscape photography and videography, but I never got a chance to shoot mountains. I have never really felt like that before. But after I, we came to Pokhara, and since we're living here watching the mountain, I realized that that's so weird that I come from a mountain country. I'm a mountain girl, and I have never shot a photo of mountain. Yeah, I think that's something that most people think that since Nepal is synonymous with the Annapurna mountain range yeah. and the Himalayas, they assume that everybody from Nepal already knows the mountains. Yeah, but no. You didn't grow up. You grew up in... Kat mostly in Kathmandu, let's say. And before that, you were in, in Torai, Torai, which Torai. is more... Flatland. Flatland yeah. vegetation. Vege exactly. Most agricultural part of our country, so there is no mountain there. So you didn't even travel here when you were a kid, and you didn't do any trekking or not hiking when all, you were a kid? Not at all. I mean, when I was in Kathmandu, I did some hiking around Sundari Jal, but uh, at that time, we didn't have a concept of hiking. It was just more like, you know, a day trip, just for fun, like so a picnic. So it's more of a thing that tourists have brought to the country recently? <laughs> I would say from 60s, 70s, you know. I have never come to Pokhara, so I had no idea how it looked like, you know. And then when I came here, I was like in love with it. It was like, wow, it's so beautiful. And we came really in March, right? End of March. So it wasn't really a tourist season. I mean, there were not a lot of tourists here. Uh, we were lucky we came right when lockdown, lockdown happened. Lockdown happened, exactly. <laughs> so there was nobody here. We were yeah, to be honest, I haven't really seen the real, like, you know, Pokhara with tourists because a lot of people or my brothers used to say that the whole road are flooded by tourists. Yeah, tourists are back now and I don't like it near as much. I, th <laughs> I thought this was paradise. Definitely. As soon as the tourists showed back up, I'm not really uh, feeling, to be honest. Uh, definitely when the lockdown happened, it was really uh, the most beautiful time of our life because um, the whole city is just like green, clean. There is only lake and only local people around. And then uh, wherever you go, or like, you know, time to time there were some restaurants open. You have time to go sit there and eat whatever you want to eat. And then lake was so clean, mountains were so clean. Which is the other reason I thought that uh, 2021, uh, <clears throat> the whole 2020, let's say Nepal was shut down for like, you know, a whole year. Right, and then I decided uh, as soon as this uh, trekking starts back again, <clears throat> we have to hit the uh, mountain because after that, 
because when there is mountain season, uh, we will not have any space to even stay in these uh, tea houses. And uh, 2021, March, April, May is like really the best season because I also knew that uh, that is the season where rhododendron blooms all over the mountain. It is just that in the spring season. So I just wanted to uh, experience that, you know, since it was the right time, perfect timing. And then lockdown opened and we decided within a week that, okay, next week we are going to trek. Let's do this. And we don't even knew uh, anything. And we just thought like, uh, we'll figure it out, whatever. And then I did give a call to some of the tea houses just to make sure that there is a space to stay. <laughs> and they are not like, you know, completely shut. So just going to this uh, trek was a very, very unique journey. I definitely saw way more yaks than I saw people. True, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying, like, uh, especially 2021 was very unique because usually this trek is always crowded, always full of people during that season. But this time, since like people had not come back, come uh, or they haven't come from, you know, uh, different countries. And since we were living right now, in the lap of Annamburna mountain, uh, we it only took us a day to like you know do the um, hiking, and then a week of hiking, and we're on top of the mountain. So during this period, we didn't really see anybody. It was just like whole empty mountains, just you and me, and even the tea shops people were very surprised when they look at us because I think we were one of the first. Uh, <laughs> dearest up in the mountain. What would you say is your biggest takeaway from this trek and how long did it take? Just to even imagine to go to the mountains for the first time as a Nepali woman, I felt very, for myself it was a very unique experience and uh, since I have seen so much city life, I have almost forgotten the village life which I grew up in a village. So I thought that uh, why not enjoy a little bit of village mountain life that I have never seen before. And I also wanted to see not only the beautiful mountains, but also the lifestyle and what kind of vegetation they have, what kind of lifestyle they have, and what kind of hardships they have, like what is their lifestyle? What do they do for a living? I have to say that We've been here for, we've been in Nepal for three years. Yeah. The best food I've had, besides your cooking, obviously, was up during this trek in Definitely. the mountains where they don't have packaged food. You yeah. have to carry everything up there or grow it there. Yeah. But the food was phenomenal. Yeah, definitely. And we had mainly Nepali sets Nepal for every meal yeah. or just um, puri tarkari for the breakfast. Yeah, geez, yeah. What makes the food in the mountains better? than the food in the cities? I think it's just the clean mountain air, temperature, definitely. And then uh, good fertilizer that only comes from their cows, buffaloes, yaks, like, you know. Yeah, there's no chemical fertilizer. Yeah, there's no, no one's chemical fertilizer exactly. all that way. No chemical fertilizer. And uh, most importantly, I think they also save their own seeds, you know, because you can't carry everything all the time there. And then they're also focusing, especially for the Nepali dal vaset. They want to uh, cook whatever they grow, especially the green vegetables around there. And I think that is the best thing to do. Uh, you are trying to invite people in the mountain. Why, uh, <clears throat> why give them anything but whatever is grown locally? Yeah, literally when you order the food, they go out and pick it most times. Yeah, most of the times. Like for example, sag, greens. <clears throat> I really love the um, uh, mustard greens and spinach up in the mountain because they have completely different flavor than what you find here. Still we're in mountain, but this is still different. But these days they're also growing uh, all these greens in greenhouses. Now the flavor of this greenhouse greens are completely different. 
So I would say just like the air there is really like fresh, there is no pollution which is very important and that makes the food very tasty, flavorful, let's say flavorful. Let's also talk about the impact of not having any internet. Oh yeah. <clears throat> I know that I haven't used a cell phone since I've been here for three years, I haven't had a cell phone. Yeah. It's been a magical amazing experience I might never go back but while you're in the mountains they don't even have Wi-Fi yeah did that have an effect on your psyche and your overall state of mind absolutely uh, there were some places where you can buy Wi-Fi I think but you never did right? I never did yeah because I'm going to the mountains like I said I want to experience the mountain life if I want all that I can just do it in Pokhara or you know somewhere else and um, I just feel amazing because uh, when you have not Wi-Fi or when you're not in the internet, I just feel like the day was longer and then I had so much time to just sit down and enjoy the nature. Like even one hour was like uh, maybe three hours or four hours versus if you are just like scrolling or if you are in the internet one hour goes like 10 minutes it goes really fast so that was really beautiful moment I had time to just relax and forget everything since there were, if there is no internet I feel like you don't even remember things to do or like you know all these responsibilities that uh, doesn't really even matter to be honest, but uh, if you are in the internet, there are so many things that suddenly starts mad, you know, suddenly matters, let's see. So does that help your creativity? Because I have a feeling that since social media has popped up, I've definitely noticed that everything's become kind of homogenized. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody's kind of doing the exact, exact same, same thing. thing. Yeah, <laughs> hashtag this national day, hashtag oh, this day <laughs> and that day. Um, I think it did, that's why um, even though I got the uh, contract from my publisher right before we went on a trek, I wanted to wait until I come back because I feel like that might uh, that might change something inside me. So you had already signed with your publisher before going, but a lot of these pictures from the trip ended up in your book. Um, well, I had already got the contract. I hadn't signed the contract. Mm. What I told my publisher was, uh, since we're already uh, about to go, you know, I think after two days we're about to go to this trek. I didn't want it to rush because my excitement was like, just like, you know, oh my God, <laughs> let me, let me just relax a little bit and enjoy this uh, feeling and then maybe like go on a trek and just like, you know, dream about how I exactly want to complete this book because now I have found the publisher, the, it's happening, like, you know, it's getting real. So I went there and then obviously all this time since I wasn't in the internet and I already forgot what I have to do, you know, I don't have to do daily chores or things like that. Uh, all the time when I was working, obviously book was always in my mind and everywhere I look in the nature, I mean I enjoyed the nature and still book is, was in my mind. While I was also shooting pictures, I was also thinking like, you know, oh my god, my book is called Plant Based Himalaya and then I have never uh, shot a picture of Himalaya. This is crazy and now I'm in the Himalaya and now I'm going to put some of these pictures in my uh, book and then finish it and then submit it to my publisher. So just, I think this trick really helped me to just summarize like how I really want my cookbook even though I knew like you know what I want and what I want for these two years but uh, after the trek since I I decluttered my mind completely and only focused in my book I feel like uh, it did it made a lot of changes in me and also my work and just in my thought process I definitely feel that um, on every project I've ever worked on that I actually enjoyed the final outcome, yeah. I have to work on it really hard and then walk away from it yeah. and not even 
not touch it. Yeah. And then come back with a fresh mind. Yeah. And then I can finally finish it. Put Absolutely, the- I'm definitely like that. I can never finish it if I have to, like you know, work on it uh, continuously. For book. I have to give it to a publisher. So before I hand it to the publisher, you know, I'm handing them something that now I can make a lot of changes, you know. I have to make sure that this is it. This is my <laughs> final draft. Now uh, I have to be happy with this and then whatever happens, happens, right? Uh, I was very fortunate that uh, I had this one whole year of working with my copy editor where I still made so many changes especially with my photography because uh, I had so many photos in there and then my publisher loved all of them but we had to like you know cut out and only put 250 photos so I, f- I feel very lucky like having a lot of skills really helped uh, versus if I had no skills I had to depend on somebody else and uh, who knows like how the book would have turned out so I f- think uh, Taking that break was the best thing, like literally the best thing that happened. So you got back from the trek, Mm -hmm. you had all this footage, you ended up finishing your book and kind of doing the same thing with your documentary, Documentary, you put it on the shelf for a little bit and come back to it after the the book was out, book was published. Yeah. Coming back to it, how long did it take you to finish it after that? And I'd also like to know, there's a lot of trekking documentaries, especially on YouTube. Yeah. It's the hot thing to do right now. <laughs> especially you so, go on a trek. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what makes yours different than most of them that we've seen? Uh, I think the timing like, was very important, first thing, let's say, because usually uh, treks are really, I think, crowded and you don't have space to even uh, sleep. Because I, ha- I heard a lot of stories when they said that, uh, like there is only three rooms, but uh, there is to be 50 guests who also sleep in the dining halls, you know, or maybe just sleep in the tent outside. Uh, I cannot do that. <laughs> yeah, speaking of internet trends, the yeah. Instagram versus yeah, reality. The Instagram meme, versus yeah. reality. But when we went there, it was empty, and I really like how everybody had so much. Uh, excitement and they were very enthusiastic talking to us uh, especially like there is a woman a Pali woman trying to shoot and do photography and also like uh, was very open about talking local food and like um, environment sustainability like all these things that I'm really interested and they're also interested to be honest so and then I was also talking about their um, <clears throat> there, the, most of them had work abroad, especially in the Gulf countries, and I have lived abroad. Uh, also, I had my own journey of struggle. So, somewhere we had a connection in many ways, and it really made it special. If there were 50 people, I'm sure they would not have given me any time, and you know, I just would have gone there as a tourist. But now, since they had so much time, it was more like I'm. I'm traveling to like a local village, like a local people, and that was that was amazing. And even when we went up, uh, let's say like all the brothers were still working in these trails. If there were let's say 50, 100 people, they would not have completed this trail. You know, they they cannot continue working. But uh, just to see these brothers working so hard, which I have uh, shot some of the video. Which, uh, which is in my documentary. Uh, some of the stones are 100 kilo, <laughs> 100 kilo. And uh, it wasn't like a flat land, it was in the slope. They were just carrying it up and making this beautiful uh, hand carved stairs. I was just like, you know, I mean, there were so many times I just took a break and sat down and enjoyed watching them work and also trying to reflect that in myself that, uh, thinking that oh my god there are people I'm sure they don't make a lot of money first thing but uh, it is so cool there still really cool and they are they are just enjoying this process of being in the mountain and working uh, this such a hard work and also enjoying life in a tent I mean that was just like uh, 
eye opening uh, moment and also this uh, tea shop guys who were selling teas all the way up in the right before the Mardi uh, base camp where you don't even find water and you have to carry water from down I think low camp all the way up or you have to melt this uh, snow to make water so you can make some tea but just that one cup of tea definitely changed my life at that moment because it was so cold and one cup of warm tea just makes you warm from inside it was like you know even that the brother had went to gulf countries and he was really sad and came back to nepal and then his story also really moved me because i feel like he has worked so hard and something really made him think about nothing and he wants to go all the way on top of the mountain to sell tea that's one thing i definitely noticed is the people in on these treks in these far remote mountain villages, I mean, if you, if you can even call them villages, they objectively have a harder life. Yeah. But they are way nicer and way yeah. happier people yeah, yeah, exactly. than the people in the city that don't do much. Exactly, and they're so spiritual. I feel like they're so spiritual. I feel like, ways. how can you not be spiritual yeah. in, in, in such a beautiful landscape? Exactly. There's definitely. Well, well, Let's talk about that, I guess. Yeah. Do you feel like there is some kind of Shakti or power in the mountains? Absolutely, because I feel like if you are not that spiritual person, first thing, you will not go and survive on top of the mountain. It's really hard. Yeah, that's you know? the stories of yeah. all the old aesthetics. They, <laughs> yeah. Uh, all the monks, they go to yeah, the mountains. mountains. That's where they found enlightenment, yeah. right? Yeah. So, uh, of course, I'm also in search of enlightenment. And then that is why I think the mountain called me and that is why I had the ghost to like, you know, walk for seven days. Also the chefs were very interesting because while I was having this chat, they were, com they were completely so happy with their work over there where like most of them told me that who wants to go down and work? It's like always so noisy over there like, yow, yow, yow. <laughs> I can't go down and stay. I like mountain. If I'm bored with this mountain, I'll go to another mountain. Sometimes Dawlagiri, sometimes uh, Kanchanjunga, sometimes I don't know here and there. And uh, just like this kind of uh, listed chat opens up my mind of like, you know, the possibility where I've never thought about all these things. I'm just like trying to go to one mountain and I'm just thinking that maybe next time I'll go to another mountain. And these people are already doing this work only in the mountain. Like they, are, they would love to be only mountain chef. So uh, I remember when I was talking to the brother, I was like, oh my God, that would be so nice to become a mountain chef, right? You grow local food and enjoy the mountain and whenever the guest will come, you give them this most delicious, organic, authentic Nepali food that is made with love and passion and just like, you know, everything all mixed together and it is very nutritious. There were a lot of moments just in seven days since I wasn't in the internet. I had uh, lived at least, I feel like a month because I had so many interactions with so many different kind of uh, people uh, who were doing so many different things. So uh, for the film, the final product, uh -huh. what are some of your influences as far as wanting to become a filmmaker and specifically this film? What are some, some of your favorite directors or other films that inspired you? I think one of the my most favorite director is um, Satyajit Ray because his movie is more than a movie. He likes to capture the moment. It's like so beautiful that uh, no matter how many times you watch that movie, you will still find it so beautiful. So as a filmmaker, let's say, I also want to just create something beautiful. I'm still, I'm, I'm still like, this is just my first one. So I'm still learning and I'm still like thinking what kind of documentary or like, you know, films I would like to make. Cause film is a really big project. You can just say, I want to make films every year. But uh, as far as what I want to do is, um, 
I want to capture the moment. Wherever I go, I want to capture this beautiful person, this beautiful nature, and then that time. The holy moment, right? The holy, yeah, the holy moment. And then put it, put it, it out as my film. And I think that's why I, I am actually, uh, let's say I was very inspired by your um, music. Because... I'm no Ravi Shankar, I was speaking of Sajid Ray. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I was very already inspired by your music because your music is very... <clears throat> your latest music, let's say, uh, I've been listening for six, seven years because uh, every time you work, I'm also somewhere part of this music. And then especially while you're working with this Nepalaya project, I was uh, giving so much time while I was working in book. And I enjoy it because it's something very new and something I really want to listen. So every time I listen to your music, I only and look at the mountain. I feel like it's like a perfect uh, combination. And I have never heard something like this or watched together um, by anybody else, you know. So uh, like most mountain movies are like, you know, the, their soundtrack is more like very... <coughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like an action movie or action something. Action movie, yeah. exactly. And I'm like, this is not action. This is more a spiritual journey. You're more going to meditation, yeah. exactly. So uh, it just happened. Like I didn't really, I didn't really like. I worked really hard. You know, it's over a year of work. But at the same time, I enjoyed the process so much that I feel like uh, it wasn't a work. I'm like enjoying the process. This is my work and I don't care how long it will take. Uh, I'm going to like, you know, put the pieces together. And then that is my work. Yeah, speaking of the music, I really liked uh, taking influence from older Nepali culture, like old, older mountain music. Mountain music, yeah. Um, it's kind of hard to tell. Some of them are pretty obvious. Some of the remixes are obviously yeah. old Nepali tunes, yeah. sampled yeah. and run through a bunch of effects and synthesizers, uh, but some of them are more subtle. Some of the ambient tracks yeah. are old yeah. songs just uh, turned into ambient meditational Absolutely. pieces. And then also the Punchy Baja. I did a lot of the Punchy Baja because I love yeah. Punchy Baja bands. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like that's just such a, instead of just the big normal theatrical drum pack that everybody seems to yeah. use like download theatrical drum pack yeah i like to use a lot of the nepali drums and a lot of the bells actually a lot of the bells, bells that we recorded yeah, while we were up there yeah exactly um it's definitely not ravi shankar quality <laughs> but it's uh, it's a unique twist on it's a jazz f more quality <laughs> the whole journey was uh, like a spiritual journey for both of us because you have been music making music for almost 36 37 years and then uh, you were also making all this um, new music <coughs> but when you go up there and when you like declutter your mind with all these instruments that you found down here and then when you go up there you are just making music out of nature and whatever you find there. So it was experimental for both of us. And that's why we did a lot of bell samples because bell were the only thing that uh, we found there. It's crazy, you'll yeah. hike for days and yeah. then just suddenly come yeah. across a temple <laughs> exactly. in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere, exactly. And there's bells, who knows how old they are. Yeah, exactly. And there's hundreds of them, literally hundreds. More than that, yeah. yeah. And they sound amazing, especially when you do them all yeah. at different times and then you have the wind blowing them. Yeah. It's definitely magical. Yeah, and besides that, uh, whenever we were going through all this tree canopy, they were also making sounds. And there were so many other, like the birds were making very unique sounds. And there were so many birds that we have never seen down here. And since we were only the ones uh, in the during the hike, uh, we were so quiet that uh, we were able to listen the bird and the yak and the horses. There were donkeys, I mean, and there were the bells of the donkeys, you know. So overall, I feel like uh, 
documentary was itself an experimental documentary because we had no idea how we exactly wanted to do it because up in the mountain there are different weathers and you can also see that in the documentary one day it is sunny one day it is rainy uh, next day it is a snowy snowstorm hail storm so i mean uh it was challenging but at the same time it was very thrilling <laughs> so where can someone check the documentary if they want to watch it you can search my channel vegan nepal uh, to check out my documentary badal dada so let's get a little weird now. Yeah. Cause you know, you're married to me, you know I'm into weird stuff. Yeah. Uh, and you run a company that promotes vegan uh -huh. living. Plant-based diet. Plant-based diet. Yeah. How do you feel about how corporations have taken over the vegan movement? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. Because when I first decided to go vegan in 2016, uh, it was more about my own cleansing journey because I came from a country where there were no packaged uh, meats, you know, and then uh, how <clears throat> I, I discovered how uh, I was eating all these frozen meat that were not even local and I was discovering that I'm eating all these packaged food, sausages, uh, all these dairy products that uh, were all the dairy products were full of hormones, you know, things like that. So I thought I need a really good cleanse because this is not how I wanted my life, but uh, somehow I am a part of it, right? And then I went on that journey and then I discovered a new world within a year, like let's say 2017, 2018, that uh, plant-based business has become, is growing business and it's like a billion trillion dollar business now. And it's run by the same people who ruined the food industry in the first place. Exactly. And then, your Monsanto, um, yeah. your Bill Gates, Bill Gates everybody, yeah. all these uh, companies that ruined and industrialized farming in general, which is the problem. And not only that, uh, I also started seeing that all the celebrities are starting like fake meat company and then, you know, uh, vegan leather company or this company, that company. I mean... People whose bodies are not real are promoting food that is not real. <laughs> is that, that's the way I would put it. Well, what I, what my goal was and how I saw plant-based lifestyle versus like, you know, how people started seeing uh, plant-based lifestyle with money was completely different. You want to go plant-based lifestyle, eat plants, right? Exactly. Eat plants and carry things that really comes out of the plant and already help the people that, uh, who are already producing these things. Not like you start another business and another business and another business and just create so much garbage. And for those people, they don't care about the garbage because they haven't seen these uh, rivers, you know. And the, the companies that are promoting climate change, pollution, all yeah. the same ones that have done all the pollution and they're trying to act like it's the consumer's fault. Yeah. And also, I personally just hate corporations in general, but I think more importantly, it's you should focus on sustainable living. I personally don't eat meat, yeah. but that's more of a spiritual thing and more, I think just it's better for your digestive health. But if people want to eat meat, I think they should, they should do it. But they should get it from a real farmer yeah. or have their own animal that they take care of yeah. and treat with respect. Or even better, go hunting because especially in America, there's a lot of areas where the wildlife is causing damage. Yeah. And you need to bring down yeah. the numbers. Yeah. So, and that food, that meat is way better than Fresh meat, your, like your, your how packaged we crappy meat. Yeah. From these or animals that are tortured, meat. basically. Yeah, even the fake meat, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and even the fake meat. I don't like the fake meat, it's full of oil bad seed oils, it's not, has no nutritional value. Yeah, and no nutritional value. And that's the main problem value. with industrialized food is it's taken all the nutritional value out. Yeah. I never drank milk until I came to Nepal. 
Yeah. And now I love it. <laughs> I get milk fresh daily from my guy down the street. Who's it's the so good. Guy He's the happiest guy I've ever met. Yeah. His cows are super happy. Yeah. And speaking of happy animals, literally, there's cows that just walk around the streets around here. Yeah. Traffic stops for the cows here. They're treated with more respect. I mean, they're literally gods here. Yeah, cow is a Lakshmi. Yeah, so people treat their cows with yeah. a lot of respect and you can taste it. And the milk is not pasteurized. Yeah. It literally comes out the same day and I drink it the same day and it's amazing and it's full of all the nutrients that they strip out when they pasteurize it. Yeah. And Speaking of the U.S., I don't know the specifics, but there's a lot of states where it's literally illegal. Like, I can get drugs easier than I can get raw milk. Raw milk, yeah. Mm. Well, uh, speaking of other people's diet, I feel like people should eat what your body wants, you know? I never really tell people that you have to go vegan. I chose to become vegan at that time because that, that is what my body wanted. Like, you know, I was really feeling sick of eating these things, which I feel like, you know, why should I feel like this? If plant is making me happy, I should eat plant. Like, I should make my soul happy. That is the whole purpose of our life, right? Uh, again, like you said, like, you know, in different parts of the world, there are different situations. So exactly. I cannot really like live in New York City and start telling people that, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Like, that is not the goal of my life. First off, you should not live in New York City. <laughs> it's not healthy for you. <laughs> I'm just saying like, you know, I see all these people like, uh, especially who are very hardcore vegans that uh, they, they don't want to see other perspective. You know, that's why I really wanted to go see the mountains and mountain life because uh, I want to know how they are living, you know, and what condition they are living. I mean, they, they don't get all the you know, seeds we have, all the, uh, let's say, nuts we have, all the, all the things that, you know, grains, let's say, dal, you know, things like that. They don't get everything what we have, so they have to leave whatever they grow or whatever they have around them. That's their lifestyle. And personally, I think what a lot of vegans in the cult get wrong, from my perspective, is telling other people what to do with their lives. In general, like not only vegan, I mean, uh, I everybody, feel like yeah, everybody, yeah. like, you know, I feel like this whole world is kind of a cult. Somebody, everybody is in some kind of cult. <laughs> some are in religious cult, some are in diet cult, some are in corporate cult, some are in coffee cult, I don't know. Well, and you just call it culture at culture, some point. Yeah, yeah. Culture, <laughs> Once it gets exactly. big enough, it's just culture. So culture, exactly. So, I mean, obviously I might, I'm, I was, I think I was strict as well in my in my twenties, you know, where whatever I think is like, oh, uh, this is right, you know. We all go through that phase, but when you start seeing other kind of people, other kind of culture, and just like you know, understanding them, that is the most important thing. If you start understanding other people and culture, that's when you start understanding that there is many ways to live this life, and that is why we are here for. And that's how we go from one phase to another phase and another phase. And that's how whoever wants to get enlightenment, let's say, they will follow all these steps to get enlightenment. You can just eat meat and uh, do all these killings and this and that, drink alcohol and, you know, smoke cigarette, do hardcore drugs and say that, you know, I will get enlightenment. And it goes back to what I was saying at the beginning of the episode. Do you want to be an influencer or do you want to be influential? Influencers will tell other people yeah. what to do about their lives and not ever look at what's wrong with themselves. What time to eat, what time and inf to... <laughs> someone who is actually influential will just focus on them and yeah. making sure that they're doing the best thing for yeah. their lives, yeah. their families, yeah. their communities. Community. And people will take note of that yeah. and will respond. Yeah. That's very true and that is, I think, what I learned in my 30s because uh, there were a lot of things I was doing in 20s which obviously, like I said, I was still learning. It was my growing phase from like uh, Nepal life to American life, you know. Well, I also think that it's, it's forced on people. It's uh, conditioning by corporations. 
ab absolutely to be honest because kids have very uh, delicate mind and you are so easily manipulated and brainwashed especially with the social media these days and they spend so much money advertising yeah, and exactly. advertising is social conditioning that's exactly. everyone who wrote wrote the books on yeah. advertising like yeah. Bernays all that their social conditioning yeah I'm, I'm really surprised that how these people have so much money to do a sponsor post where I've been doing this I'm working so hard for seven years and to do one sponsor post for example only for ten dollars I have to think thousand times and a lot of time I don't even do a sponsor post is if I have to do an event, then maybe I'll do a sponsor post. Otherwise, I don't even care about a sponsor post. Well, yeah, because all it's going to get you and is, money. and it's a waste of time because yeah. all it's going to get you is a bunch of fake bot accounts. Bots. Yeah, exactly. And if that's what, you know, publishers or record labels yeah. or whatever want, yeah, you're going to get subpar. Yeah. Uh, subpar yeah. content. You're going to yeah. get less creative creators because. People that are actually good at their things don't want to spend money no. to get no. fake bought. Not only that, they don't have time for all these social medias, to be honest. I get it, like, you know, we live in a world that social media is very important. And it was also very important for me, because if I had no social media presence, I would have really hard time to get this book deal as well. But at the same time, I think your work is more important. You know? But you were also turned down by a lot of major publishers Absolutely. just based on your follower count. Follow. Yeah. That was, uh, to be honest, very another eye-opening experience for me where like, you know, just because I didn't have 100k followers or 50k followers, uh, I wasn't really a fit uh, cookbook author for them, where I was thinking that but I am the uh, chef and the photographer, designer, editor. I do the illustration and I also will give you an idea of like what I really want in the book uh, because I just don't want to publish a book. I want to have great ideas. So the book will be always fresh. Either it is 2022 or 2032 or, you know, in the future. But I'm really happy. Uh, I knew like, you know, person who really has a good eye for art and food and food photography, they'll find me. Yeah, someone was smart enough to pick it up and yeah. I think they're going to make a lot of money yeah. putting your book out. <laughs> Over the long run, I think uh, they will do really good and I think they are proud of my work. Because, I'm uh, proud of you, so. Because this is not only like a cookbook, you know, this is like the first vegan and vegetarian cookbook from the him uh, from Nepal and uh, there is a uh, it I feel like this work will open up I for a lot of young photographers graphic designers artists women and just in women in color or just in general women that you know it's okay that you haven't done anything you know you're still creative you need to figure out what you want to do with your creativeness. Because like I said, until the age of 30, I didn't even know cookbook really exist. Maybe in my subconscious, I knew. But for me, it was only for the rich kids or who has money or a very famous chef, master chefs. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think people are creating for a lot of the wrong reasons now. People are creating and becoming artists because they want followers. They want to be... They want the uh, attention, whereas I feel like in the past, yeah. the great works of art and the great creators that actually made a big impact, yeah. it wasn't about them, it wasn't about their ego. Yeah. They made it for the gods or God. Yeah, or Allah, it was there just or like. The uh, all or yeah. whatever you want to <laughs> yeah. call it. It yeah. wasn't about them, it was yeah. about they were just a vessel. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that is how I was also inspired because I grew up in that culture where like, you know, uh, most of my ancestors, like for example, I grew up in uh, Torai and Kathmandu where Torai people inspired me to become a great farmer and uh, house 
household person, let's say, you know, because they're very family oriented. There was not a lot of businesses going on. But when I grew up in Kathmandu, since I come from a newer ethnicity, I see this beautiful, marvelous work of art in temples, in your, uh, let's say, uh, all the jewelry designs or even like dishes and like, you know, yeah, everything, was handmade. everything is handmade and also very intricate and it's like perfection because it wasn't just one generation of work, it was generations and generations of work because, you know, a certain cast will make one thing and then their next generation will pick up and then again next generation will pick up the same work. So for me, somewhere I was also very like, you know, very inspired by that creation of perfection, let's say, where like, uh, since I already come from this ethnicity and background, I feel like uh, that is what I know how, what to do. Like, I cannot do something that I don't know and I don't want to even do that. Because I, once I went to college, I could have worked in a corporate job and then make money and then climb the ladder up, right? But I, I just couldn't do it. Like, you know, I had this um, discussion within myself that am I supposed to do that just because I came to America or uh, am I supposed to be this artist that I wanted to be before I came to you know, US? So that brings me to the last point I want to make because we're losing the light and let's go ahead and wrap this up. Yeah. <laughs> but do you think a lot of that is getting lost in your culture now? Because obviously Nepali culture has a rich, rich history of amazing temples yeah. and temple builders that go all around the world to create these temples. Yeah. And beautiful wood carvings, yeah. beautiful statues. Yeah. I mean, everything, the uh, Dhaka yeah, designs, from the cloth handmade. designs, from but the... But I don't, I don't see that as much now. And even with all these concrete houses that you see, yeah. I feel like a lot is being lost. I can't find a door that works properly here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's not perfect at all these days, yeah. Nothing seems to work right. Maybe, yeah. So is it getting lost? Are all the best people going out? Are they just not interested in doing it? Or am I just missing it? Uh, I think like uh, my generation was really influenced by the West and uh, they didn't really value our ancestor work and our ancestors they didn't work for money they like i said it was a generational work so they did it for it was their responsibility it was their dharma karma dharma right and then because of this uh, new influence let's say after 60s which i have noticed like you know after 60s and 70s People are really business minded. They just want to earn fast money and uh, to create this work, you don't even have to go to uh, school or college. You just have to sit down and work or work for somebody who really knows this work, right? And all of a sudden, this whole wave, I, what I have seen that all this wave came where neither the temple design is valued, neither these handmade works are valued because uh, everything is now coming from India and China and they are very, very, very cheap, right? <clears throat> and then the whole... Yeah, you can't get quality stuff quali anymore. It's, there is no quality and it's not even like uh, healthy to wear, you know. And uh, there are fast fashion and like packaged food again started to come. So like in general, I feel like uh, the, there is a loss of and lost of the respect of handmade work because uh, my, let's say my father generation, they thought that uh, their parents are already doing it. I don't have to do it, you know. They were spoiled kids in my opinion because, you know, we were already rich in so many things. Why should I do this? I have everything, let's say, you know. And then since they didn't have that concept, they could not give it to their children so for me either it is cooking or architecture or art i feel like every generation has to continue it just as to maintain that quality and since it was not maintained since this 30 40 years now you can see there is not even one beautiful house here it's full of concrete 
and we are right next to the mountain and the, uh, we are supposed to only build building that is only two story height but now they are building 10 story height which is also illegal to be honest but somewhere they are making 15 story height so I feel like uh, so it's just a general nihilism and focus on making money fast money yeah fast only money, money yeah and just a uh, people forget about God if you don't yeah. if you don't worship any gods yeah. You you do whatever. Yeah, and they, if you don't worship yourself, yeah. you're gonna not take care of yourself. Yeah. If you don't worship nature, you're yeah. gonna pollute it. If you don't exactly. worship the cow, exactly. you're gonna be rude to it rude and to, just yeah. slaughter it. Exactly. exactly. If you don't worship vegetables, exactly. you're not gonna Eat grow them healthy. well. Exactly. Or like uh, you are not really caring about eating nutritious, healthy uh, vegetable as well. So if you do care about eating nutritional food check out vegan nepal everywhere online yeah and don't forget to buy my book if you really if you really want to like change your lifestyle because uh, this um, recipes the 38 recipes i have been cooking since i was 12 years old and which is the other reason i put all these recipes in my cookbook because i want a 12 year old cook this food <laughs> and teach their parents how to cook delicious plant-based food and enjoy it. And all these recipes taste just as good right next to a steak, a grass-fed steak. So if you want to eat a steak, also <laughs> you can have this on the sides. You don't have to buy into the vegan cult to enjoy these recipes because I don't. But I respect your work and I respect yeah. anybody who does want to go vegan for the right reasons. Yeah. So like and subscribe. Check out my other uh, podcast, check out some of my music, and definitely check out her documentary and book. Thanks for watching. Thank you.